this morning uh, as we continue this series, uh, What's On My Mind? And whether you're joining us right here in the worship center, or you might be joining us in the courtyard or the family worship venue, or just right here online, I just, I get really excited about how the Holy Spirit can move, and I really believe this. I really believe that the Holy Spirit is going to move mightily this morning. And when I was asked to preach in this series, I went back to my office, and I began to pray and said, Holy Spirit, what are you putting on my heart? And there were a few words that I just couldn't shake, and they were the words, time well spent. Because here's what I know. We can get so caught up in our own routines of life. We can get so caught up in our own busyness of life that we actually forget to go and spend time with people. And people all around us are fighting battles. They're hurting. People are broken. People are lonely. And more people than ever are searching for spiritual truth. And then I look at the Gospels. I look at the way Jesus lived. Jesus loved people. Jesus was filled with compassion. And Jesus went to people. And when Jesus went and spent time with people, their entire lives were flipped upside down. And it was changed for all eternity. And so I want to wake up every single morning and say, Jesus, give me your eyes to see people the way that you see them. Give me your hands to love people and serve people the way that you do. And Jesus, give me your feet so that I can go to people. And my prayer is that that's who we want to become. That Shoreline Church, the people here want to go to a broken and lost world and love people the way Jesus does. Because when we do that, lives can be changed for all eternity. More and more people will become totally committed to Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, that is time well spent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as we jump into your word now, that you would speak in this place, Jesus. That your Holy Spirit would move powerfully. God, that you would challenge our hearts, that you would equip our hearts. God, that we would walk out of here changed, that we would want to go to a lost and broken and hurting world and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And Jesus, as we do this, I pray that more and more people come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. pray all this in your name. Amen. When I was a freshman at Northwestern College in St. Paul, Minnesota, we were informed of a Christian film that was going to be played on campus. And anytime I I hear of a Christian film that's going to be played, the first thing I often ask myself is, is this going to be any good? And all we knew was it was a a film based on missions. And at the time, I was taking a class called Evangelism and Missions. I was also, from the time I was a little kid, I used to say, man, I just want to be a missionary when I grow up. I was a little kindergartner when I filled out my little thing of what you want to be when you grow up. I said, I want to be a missionary. And this particular film was called End of the Spear. And End of the Spear focuses on five missionaries right up here on the screens that want to take the message of the gospel to the Waodani people. But these five missionaries had uh, really two things that were working against them. First thing was they did not know the the language very well at all. And secondly, the Waodani people were known to not only spear each other, they were also known to spear foreigners. So this really was an intense mission, but it was a mission that they felt like the Holy Spirit had really put on their hearts was to take the gospel to the Waodani people. And Nate Saint, one of the missionaries, used to fly his plane over the Amazon basin. And there came a point where he said, I found this place where we can land the plane. It's right on the river. There's a sandbar. It's perfect. And so he goes back and he tells the guys and the mission is set in place. And before they leave, Nate Saint looks at his son dead in the face. And his son looks back at him and says, Dad, just promise me this. If you get in a jam, if you get in a real jam, promise me you'll utter these words. Bua, bia, and numbua which means I am your friend. I am your sincere friend. And his dad just looked back at his little boy and he smiled. And he just talked about how the Waodani didn't know Jesus. And those five missionaries boarded the little plane. They landed on that sandbar. And they were excited. This was the beginning of taking the gospel to the Waodani people. But on January 8th, 1956, all five of those men were speared and killed by the Waodani people. And I know like right now you're probably going, how is that time well spent? Like that, that just sounds awful. But here's what I want you to know. That's just the beginning of the story. And in about 20 minutes, you're gonna fully find out why that was time well spent. And this morning we're looking at an encounter that Jesus had with a man who was far from him. And as Jesus encountered this man, as Jesus spent time with this man, his entire life was flipped upside down. And as I study the scriptures, as I study these verses I was once again reminded of just how amazing and valuable it is to go to people 
and to spend time with them. So if you have your Bibles open, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. If you don't have your Bibles, the verses will be on the screen as well. Here's what it says. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And as we dive in this morning, I just want to give you a little background on who Zacchaeus was, because for many of us, when we hear the name Zacchaeus, the first thing we think of is the short little guy from the Bible. And for many of us as well, you think of that little song we sang in Sunday school growing up about Zacchaeus being a wee little man. But there's so much more to that. That's just barely scratching the surface of who Zacchaeus was. You know, when you start to peel back the layers of his life, there actually is a lot more going on. His name actually means righteous one but he was far from living up to what his name actually meant. If there was a spectrum, and on this side of the spectrum was the word righteous, and if on this side of the spectrum was the word unrighteous, Zacchaeus fell clear on this side. Zacchaeus himself was Jewish, but even his own people would have never considered him a righteous person. He was the chief tax collector of Jericho, which was about 10 miles from Jerusalem, and he was not a good man. He worked directly for the Roman occupation, and the people constantly began to talk about the high taxes. So a guy like Zacchaeus would go collect taxes from the people, and then he would pocket just a little bit extra. He added on there, and everybody knew it was an open thing, that you would just kind of rob from the people. This was the life of Zacchaeus, and the people despised him for it. And as I continued just to, to research and study, I came across a line in a, in a, in a book that I was reading. And it was a line that really struck me and I stopped and I read it over and over and over again. Because what happens in our lives so often is we can look at people for their sin. We can look at people for their past. We can look at people for who they are and we forget to look at people the way Jesus does. And here's what it said. Though Zacchaeus was a renegade in the eyes of the Jews, he was a precious lost sinner in the eyes of Jesus. And I don't know what you walked in here with this morning. You may be struggling a lot. You may be walking in with some intense shame and guilt. You could be walking in feeling like the whole weight of the world is on your shoulders. You might be walking in here today feeling like you're a million miles away from Jesus. And he might be asking, does Jesus really love me? And the answer is absolutely. You are deeply, deeply loved by Jesus. And what I want every single person in here this morning to, to fully know is that we are all just a bunch of sinners who fall short of the glory of God which means we're in good company. And so this morning, I want you guys just to lean in as we get to see Jesus have this encounter with Zacchaeus and how his life was completely transformed, how his life was changed, how it was turned upside down by Jesus just stopping in a moment and going to Zacchaeus. And I wanna focus on Jesus just for a second because in Luke chapter five, Jesus has called his first disciples and he's already began to perform miracles. And then by Luke chapter eight, uh, he's already calming storms. He's, he's, he's meeting with people. He's speaking in parables. He's doing all these incredible things. And now we get to Luke 19. And Jesus is passing through Jericho. And Zacchaeus wants to run and get a glimpse of him. And here's the first thing I have for this morning is Jesus is coming and Zacchaeus comes running. Jesus is coming and Zacchaeus comes running. Here's the first four verses. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, 
He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Jesus is coming and Zacchaeus comes running. This really is an amazing moment. The man who takes more than he should from the people, the man who's despised by the people, he wants to run to Jesus, which means this. He also has to run to the crowd. It would have made all the sense in the world for a guy like Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector of Jericho, to run in the complete opposite direction. But that day, Zacchaeus chooses to run to Jesus. And back then, it would have been extremely rare to ever see a wealthy government official running anywhere. So this really is a special moment. Zacchaeus comes running. He is like a little boy who's running to see the biggest parade in town. He's filled with this curiosity. He's filled with this excitement that's building up inside of him. And most likely, he has all these questions rolling through. Like, why the large crowds? Why are so many people flocking to see this Jesus? Like, what on earth could I possibly be missing out on? And as he arrives on the scene, he is so short that he can't even see over the people. And he could have looked at this as, as a defeat. He could have looked at, looked at this and just said, well, I can't see anything. I wanted to see Jesus, but it's packed and I can't see, so I'm just gonna go home. I'm gonna turn around and run the opposite direction. But he doesn't do that. He runs ahead of the crowd and he finds a sycamore fig tree and he climbs up in it just to get a glimpse of Jesus. And so this morning, as you look at your own life, what is keeping you from running after Jesus? What is keeping you from running after Jesus? You know, for some of you, you may not yet know Jesus as Savior. You know, maybe you're joining us this morning right here on campus. You might be joining us online, and you're curious just like Zacchaeus. You know, you might be thinking the sins of your past somehow discount you from a relationship with Jesus Christ. But like I already said, you are absolutely deeply loved. And there is no greater freedom in your life than letting the walls of your heart come down and letting Jesus come in. Having your life changed for all eternity and walking a new life with him because your life will never be the same. And it's very possible that you may have walked in here this morning. You know, you had that moment where you went all in with Jesus. You asked him to be Lord of your life, but over the course of time, you began to run from Jesus. Certain sins that you got entangled in and it leaves you wondering, does Jesus really love me? And I want you to know this. Jesus has never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's been walking right there with you. And he loves you deeply. On Tuesday nights, I have the incredible privilege of leading a young men's study here on campus. And we were going over the book called Rescue. And if you're a man in here, I'd highly encourage you to write the name of that book down, Rescue by Justin Camp. Incredible book. But chapter two opens up with two friends in their late 20s. And they're on this great uh, adventure trip up in Switzerland. And on their final day, they're descending on skis into Zermatt. And on the way down, one of the buddies falls into a crevice and he goes in deep. He's banged up, he's bruised, and he lands in complete and utter darkness. And his friend up top, he's got the Swiss rescue team all ready to go dialed in. So he dials it and he calls him and says, my buddy has fallen into a crevice. The Swiss rescue team gets moving, they get up there right away. They lower them down into, into the crevice. They bring his buddy up who's banged up out of darkness and back into light. And he's rescued. And I love how Justin Camp uses this little illustration about Jesus in our lives. And here's what he said. Nothing is too horrible or dangerous for Jesus. He can handle the worst of the worst. And the darkness doesn't stand a chance. His love and mercy, honestly, are simply too powerful there's nothing too messy, there's nothing too big in your life where the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ couldn't cover. There's no amount of shame, there's no amount of guilt that would ever keep him from loving you. And Zacchaeus is about to experience that as he's up in a tree. Taking that first step that day was gonna change everything for him because this is gonna be the new start of a sinful man. And so here's a little encouragement for you this morning. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. If you are with us this morning and you are passionately pursuing Jesus, I love that. But I want to encourage you, keep running after Jesus. Keep pursuing holiness. Pursue him with your whole life. And this morning, you could be the person that, that had that moment where you went all in with Jesus. But over the course of time, you began to run from him. Let today be the day where you turn around and say, Jesus, I'm coming home. Because his arms are open like this to you. And he says, welcome home.
And if you're with us this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I wanna encourage you. Let today be that day you make the first step like Zacchaeus did and run to Jesus. Your life will never be the same. You will be a brand new person. And for Zacchaeus, he's made that effort. He made the effort to run to Jesus and all of a sudden the unexpected happens. Something he could have never dreamt up in his wildest dreams is about to happen. Zacchaeus is seen. Zacchaeus is seen by Jesus. And that day when he ran ahead and climbed up in that sycamore fig tree, I can guarantee you, there was no anticipation that Jesus might stop, look up in the tree, and actually say his name. But that's about what, what's gonna happen. If you look at verses five and six, here's what it says. When Jesus reached the spot, the spot meaning the fig tree where he's at, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I just wanna sit in this moment just for a little bit because it's a very special moment. It is a beautiful moment. Zacchaeus arrives on the scene. He can't see over the crowd. The only option for him to see Jesus is to actually climb a sycamore fig tree. So that's what he does. And Jesus is now approaching the tree. He can see Jesus coming. And as Jesus approaches the tree, he stops. And at this point, I always ask myself, what exactly is going through the mind of Zacchaeus in this moment? The one that he so desperately wanted to see is now right beneath him in the tree. I wonder if he's thinking, is Jesus just tired? Is he taking a break? Is he gonna have a conversation with somebody? Like, why is he stopping? Like, Jesus, get, get going. There's a lot of people that wanna see you yet. But all of a sudden, the unexpected happens. Jesus looks up as Zacchaeus up in the tree and he says four words that change everything. He says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. You gotta remember, these two have never met before and Jesus calls him by name. Such a special moment, such a special moment. That day Zacchaeus thought that he was running after Jesus, that he was chasing after Jesus, that he was the one seeking Jesus. But all along, Jesus was the one seeking Zacchaeus. And being who Zacchaeus was, this, this chief tax collector, I highly doubt that he had this great circle of friends. I doubt that he had a best friend. It's very doubtful that there were very many people, if anyone, that actually ever even cared about his life. So Jesus stopping at the fig tree in this moment and saying his name really is a big deal. And we don't know a lot about Zacchaeus. I mean, he is short. He's a tax collector, and he's not a good man. But if you were to start peeling back the layers of this guy's life, the layers of his heart, there's a lot that's going on down here. But the people of Jericho, they were never slowing down their lives to actually hang out with this man. I mean, he's a terrible human, human being. They saw this guy walking down the street. They weren't the ones slowing down, saying, Zacchaeus, it's great to see you. Hope you have a good day. You know, if they saw him coming, they didn't put up their hand and go, high five, Zacchaeus. They stayed as far away from this guy as possible. But on this day, in a sycamore fig tree, Jesus stops and he calls him by name. And just for a moment, I want you just to think how, like, how he felt, like, like what was going through his heart in this moment, just the immense joy that he's feeling. Probably even a little bit of shock, like, oh my gosh, Jesus just called my name. But the wonder that is feeling his heart because his day just changed big time. But even more than that, his entire life is about to be changed. And when he woke up that morning, I highly doubt it was on his radar to say, Jesus, today I submit my life to you. Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Jesus, today I choose to repent of my sin and walk into new life with you. I highly doubt it was on his radar that Jesus would actually see him and call him by name. But rest in this, there's absolutely nothing you have ever done, and Zacchaeus is proving this, that the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ couldn't cover. I've been in youth ministry for, for 15 years now, and I absolutely love it. And I was at my first church for seven years. And our, our group was growing like at a really rapid pace. And every week it seemed like new students were coming, and we were grateful. Students were inviting their friends. And I noticed one night, one night this girl wandered into our church. So I walked over there, and I introduced myself to her. I said, hey, my name's Brandon. What's your name? She goes, Hey, my name's Charlie. She's kind of like that. And every time there's a new female, I always try to introduce her to a female leader so she can get her connected. So I took her over to her leader, Anna. I said, hey, this is Charlie. She's here for the first time. And as I get up to teach that night, she sits right here. 
right in the front row. And I'm teaching and her eyes are just locked. She's soaking in everything I'm saying because for the first time, she was hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you could totally tell it was affecting her life. And by the end of the night, I walked over to one of our student leaders and I said, man, it was so awesome having Charlie here tonight. And he looked at me kind of funny, kind of one of these faces. He goes, that's not her name. I said, oh, that's what she told me. And it fi- came to find out that she didn't want to tell me her, her real name because she had the reputation at her high school that no girl wanted. But she found herself in our church that night. And so I began to pray. I said, Lord, bring her back. Like, bring her back. Let, let, her, let her fall in love with you. Let her experience you. But not only that, Jesus, bring her to Sundays. I would love to see her sitting here amongst a, a family. And lo and behold, she starts coming on Sunday mornings. And as she's coming on Sunday mornings, there was this woman named Joanne. Joanne's amazing. She loves Jesus. Joanne was probably mid-50s at the time. She walked up to this girl, introduced herself, and started to mentor her, started to disciple her. And then she took her to a conference, and Joanne texted me and said, Brandon, you're not going to believe it. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And I looked at that, and I just, I loved it. And here we are. We have a group of students that are sitting right here. And I want to encourage you to continue to get to know students. You could have a huge impact on their life. And here's a little encouragement for you. There is no past so bad that Jesus can't heal or restore. There is no past so bad that Jesus can't heal or restore. And for Zacchaeus, he begins to understand this. And for the first time, he feels big. Not like he just grew to six foot, but for the first time, something is growing inside of him. It's this newfound faith that he's having in Jesus. Once small, now big. This is how he's feeling. And as Jesus calls his name, and as Zacchaeus begins to climb out of that tree, Jesus welcomes him gladly. It's such a beautiful picture. But the people that are watching this unfold, they all feel different. Here's what it says as we carry on. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. The crowd began to look at each other and they were, utter, they were in utter and disbelief that Jesus was actually gonna spend time with a sinner like Zacchaeus. To them, it made absolutely zero sense that Jesus has slowed down his life to focus on the chief tax collector of Jericho. The man that cheats these people, the man that robs these people, and Jesus slows down to hang out with him. It makes zero sense. The people are literally looking at each other going, really, Jesus? Out of all the people that came to see you today, the streets are packed. Look at all these people that came to love you. Look at these people that came to see you. They're so different than this evil man, but that's who you want to focus on? And here's what I can tell you. This isn't the first time that Jesus has had an interaction with a tax collector, with somebody that's far from him. In Luke chapter five, Jesus has this amazing interaction with Levi. And Levi was a tax collector sitting in his tax booth and as Jesus begins to pass by, he looks at Levi and he says, hey Levi, follow me. And Levi gets up and he follows Jesus. Here's what it says in Luke 5, 27. If you have your Bibles, you can flip back just a few chapters to Luke 5, verses 27 through 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus truly is in the business of spending time with sinners and it's pretty clear why as to why Jesus wants to go spend time with people that don't know him, why he wants to spend time with people that are far far from him. And the answer to that is in verses 31 and 32. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Levi was gonna have a complete changed life all because Jesus slowed down and he looked at him and he said, Levi, follow me. 
And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that saw this, they couldn't believe what their eyes were seeing, that Jesus was going to go sit and eat and drink with such, with such sinful people. And now in Luke 19, as Zacchaeus makes his way out of the tree, and as Jesus welcomes him gladly, that same mindset's unfolding. The people cannot believe what they're seeing before their very eyes, that Jesus would spend time with someone like Zacchaeus. But these moments that Jesus spent with people like Zacchaeus and like Levi was time well spent. Because as Jesus sat with them, as Jesus heard their stories, their lives were changed for all eternity. Their lives were flipped upside down all because Jesus went to them and spent time with them. And this morning, your life can change forever as well. Jesus willingly went to the cross to die for our sin. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus took all of, our, all of our sin, he took all of our shame, he took all of our guilt, and he put it on himself. He did this willingly so that we could have new life, that we could have abundant life in him, that we could repent, or in other words, we could turn away from our sin and enter into this new life with Jesus. And here's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And if you're sitting here this morning and you just kind of feel like uh, your heart is just being stirred, you might be sitting here and you're going, man, I just got some tears in my eyes. I wanna encourage you, let this be the day that you run to Jesus, just like Zacchaeus did. Let this be the day that Jesus changes your heart. Let this be the moment your whole entire life is turned upside down because it's a beautiful moment. And here's a little encouragement. You are precious in the sight of Jesus. You are seen you are known and you are loved. And I honestly believe that there's people in here this morning that need to hear that message, that you are precious, that you are seen, that you are known and you are loved by Jesus. And I just wanna take a moment just to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. And that's changed hearts and lives. So if you're in here this morning, if you're joining us online and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I just wanna encourage you, let this be the moment where you run to Jesus and just say a simple prayer in your heart like this. Jesus, today I choose to run to you. I choose to stop running from you. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner in need of your grace. Today I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I surrender my heart. I surrender my life to you. And I'm gonna walk in new life with you all the days of my life. Amen. If you, have, if you said that prayer, I just wanna encourage you to come find me after the service. I'll be sitting right up here, but I would love to connect with you. And if you are joining us online and you made that commitment, you can text FAITH to the number that's on the screen and somebody will connect with you there as well. But these moments where you come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior changes everything. And it's a celebration. And in that celebration, in this coming to Jesus, coming to this new life, we get new perspective on life. And that's where we're at with Zacchaeus. Now that he's coming to Jesus, as he's having this encounter, he's now gaining new perspective in his life. Here's what it says in verses nine and 10. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. As Jesus is spending time with Zacchaeus in his house, his entire life was changed for all eternity. Zacchaeus no longer had to look at the bad man that he was. He didn't have to look at himself as the, as the tax collector that took more from the people. He didn't have to look at himself with this bitter heart that he had. He didn't have to look at himself as this lonely guy anymore. Right there in this moment with Jesus, his entire slate was wiped clean. And for the first time in his life, Zacchaeus is fully understanding that he is forgiven by Jesus. It's such a beautiful moment. And Zacchaeus wasn't saved because he promised to go do all these special works right then and there. He was saved because he responded by faith to Christ's invitation to simply follow him. It's such an amazing moment. It is time well spent. And what I love about Zacchaeus is it wasn't just like this, this moment he was having where he's just spewing words. This really was a transformation of the heart that's going on. And he tells Jesus, I'm gonna repay back what I did wrong. 
I'm going to make right what was wrong. And under Mosaic law, if a thief voluntarily confessed his crime, he had to restore what he took, add a fifth to it, and bring a trespass offering to the Lord. And if he stole something that he couldn't restore, he had to pay fourfold. And if he was caught with the goods, he had to repay double. And what I like about Zacchaeus, he's, he knows this lineup, but he didn't justify himself at all where he was in that. He just simply said, I'm gonna pay back the largest amount because I need to make, wrong, right, make right what was wrong. The former way of Zacchaeus has been put to death right then and there with Jesus in his own living room. And when our lives are changed, we have this new perspective on life. And I know many of you had the amazing opportunity to meet a man named Nabil Qureshi. He was a friend of Shoreline's, Nabil Qureshi. He wrote a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And he grew up, he grew up Muslim. And when he, when he got to college, he ended up meeting this guy named David Wood. And David Wood was a Christian. And they would get together and uh, have these little friendly de- debates. But more importantly, a friendship was forming between the two. And David said, hey, Nabil, here's what I'd love for you to do. Just research Islam and research Christianity in an equally objective light and just let me know what you find. And so that's what he does. Nabil seeks out and he, he, he starts to research Christianity and Islam in an equally objective light. And at the end of it, he goes, you're right. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he converted from being a Muslim to Christianity. And he made a big impact on people's lives. And at age 34, Nabil got stomach cancer and died and went to go meet his savior face to face. But I love those moments. Those moments with David Wood where he's just hanging out with Nabil, loving him, encouraging him, challenging him. And I can tell you this, that was time well spent. So here's a little encouragement for you. Who do you need to see with new perspective? Who do you need to see with new perspective? In other words, who do you need to see with the eyes of Jesus? Who do you need to sit with? Who do you need to go to? Who could have their life changed for all eternity because you choose to take on the likeness of Christ and say, I'm gonna go spend time with them. And if the Holy Spirit has put somebody on your heart, I just wanna encourage you to write that name down. And then to go to them and spend time with them and watch what the Holy Spirit does. Little encouragement number two, this could be the day your life changes forever. This could be the day your life changes forever. If you're sitting here and you need prayer, if you want to find out more about Jesus, I would love to talk with you after. We have a prayer team that would love to talk with you after. But this could be the day that your entire eternity is changed because you choose to run to Jesus. Those five missionaries who were in the Amazon basin who were speared that day, that was just really the beginning of the story. After they were speared, Rachel Saint, Nate Saint's sister, ended up spending 30 years with the Wild Downey people. And Jim Elliott's widow went back as well to work with them. And it was often said that they weren't speared because they were women. And while they were there, they shared the gospel. They wanted to fulfill the mission that their husbands had made for. And as they were there sharing the gospel, the Wild Downey people turned from their ways and they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They stopped killing each other, they stopped killing foreigners, and they began to walk in new life with Jesus. And the day when Zacchaeus was in the tree just seeking to get a glimpse of Jesus, his life was changed for eternity. Jesus stopped, he looked at him right in the eyes and he called him by name. And it was time well spent. And I want you guys to walk out of here just knowing four truths this morning, four truths that I want you to just to fill your heart with. And the first one is you are loved and valued by Jesus. No matter where you've been, no matter what you have done, I want you to know this, Jesus loves you. There's absolutely nothing you have ever done that would separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's never too late to fix your eyes on Jesus. And you can often feel like my life's too far gone The sins of my life are big. If people knew exactly who I was, I don't know if they would love me. I don't know if Jesus would love me. And I want to tell you this. It's never too late to fix your eyes on Jesus. Thirdly, repenting from sin and turning towards Jesus will be the best decision of your life. It's leaving the past behind you and striving for what's ahead. It's repenting from sin and asking Jesus, I'm ready to walk a new life with you. And lastly, your life's going to look different. Your life will look different. The moment you surrender your life to Jesus, you're gonna gain this new perspective on life. You're gonna become a man, you're gonna become a woman who is in pursuit of holiness, who's in pursuit of the heart of God. And so are you willing to slow your life down? 
When you walk out of here today, are you willing to slow your life down to see people the way that Jesus sees them? Because as you do that, more and more people can experience Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this, that is time well spent. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we pray, Jesus, as we walk out from this place, that you give us hearts that burn for the lost, that you give us hearts that burn for the broken and for the hurting. Jesus, I pray for, uh, for people that may be with us this morning, right here on campus or online, who are still struggling with the mindset and the thoughts of, could you really love them? Jesus, I hope they feel your love on the deepest level this morning. God, we know that you changed lives. God, we're excited uh, just to be a church who loves people the way you do. So in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brandon. Well, every week we, we give a couple of announcements up here, and I want to make sure that you, you don't just let them go by you. Every week we say we've got a team of people that want to pray with you up here. We really do. We would love to pray with you. If you have something on your heart that you really want to share with someone, you want to present to God, we would love to have you come up here and pray with one of the people up here. Uh, out in the courtyard, we've got someone over there next to the Jumbotron on the right side who would love to do so. And if you're watching online, you can uh, email prayer at shoreline.church, or you can text or call the phone number that you see on the screen, and somebody would pray with you there. And we also say every week, if you're new here, stop by the Connection Center because we'd love to get you connected. Well, I can tell you that we've had thousands of people come through our doors who've never been to the Connection Center. So if today's your first time or your 500th time and you've never been by our Connection Center, we want to welcome you to go over there. We want to invite you to go there to find out more about Shoreline because here's the deal. That you're going to get the most out of your experience at Shoreline Church if you're connected to the church. If you're involved in the ministry that we're doing throughout the week, if you're building relationships through small groups, if you're in Bible studies, if you're serving in ministry, if you're, if you're more involved than just showing up on Sundays, your faith is going to grow exponentially. And you're going to be better equipped to live out your walk with Jesus. So if you've never been by the Connection Center, we invite you to go there now. You can also just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen, and they'll send you a digital connection card, and somebody will follow up with you uh, this week so you don't have to go over there if you can't make it. So that's everyone online or here. We also always love to send you off with a word of blessing. So if you're able, we invite you to stand, and I'd like to bless you as you leave from here. Today, as you heard from Pastor Brandon, he, he shared a lot of God's truth with you. And it is my prayer that you now will go in that newfound truth, that you are seen, that you are known, and that you are loved by Jesus, that he wants to then use you to go tell this world of that same truth. So go from here, shining the light of Jesus, making those who don't know Jesus know that they are seen and that they are loved by him. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.